going to ask you to stand right now, if you would. And um, in a moment, I'm going to read the scripture. It's too short for us to do our responsive reading today, but we'll stand in honor of God's word. And so listen, before we do that, everybody, I'm very excited. Uh, And what's the word? I'm just going to share with you. I'm going to share with you exactly what I shared with Frank Turek last week, privately. He goes, where are you going next week with your series? I heard about it. I said, we're going to start a series called Futures. It's been on my heart and my mind for a long time, ever since we opened up back in May. Because I began meeting people, I still am, at this church, and now there are tens of thousands of people who are joining us online, live, and they don't have a clue, and you may not have a clue, as to what does the Bible say about our future, the future, Christ returning, the millennium, the judgment upon earth, the second coming of Christ, uh, the Antichrist, book of Revelation, the rapture, the global players in the last days, as the Bible mentions them. These things were revealed in Scripture not to confuse you. They were revealed in Scripture making a grand assumption that by the time you looked at Bible prophecy, you would have read, for example, your Old Testament and then gone right into the New. makes perfect sense if you do that. A lot of people haven't done that. So I told Frank, I said, you can pray for me, Frank, because... There's a gigantic burden on my heart because I'm going to be speaking to a whole lot of you that these things are new, but they're ancient in the Bible, but you've never been taught them at the churches you attended. And so for a lot of you, this is brand new. And so it's going to be a pretty lengthy series, but I promise you this. And I've repeated this to friends. This has been a disciple-making church for 30 years. And just when I thought like, all right, we got a lot of people settled in. They know exactly what they believe and ministry's happening. We're moving forward. Then a whole bunch of you newbies come along. (laughs) And um, it's like, Lord. And I believe God has been saying, "Now, now it's time for you to disciple them too. And so that's where we're going. As a pastor, we're going to walk through the prophetic teachings of the Bible. You're not going to be afraid. You're not going to be freaked out because I want you to keep this picture in your mind. Like you're a little lamb getting picked up and I want to be holding you as your under shepherd under Jesus. And I want to be telling you right in your ear. Now, this is what the Bible says. And that revelation to you ought to bring you comfort. It ought to bring you joy. It ought to bring you excitement. And for some people, it ought to bring you, to you a wake-up call. Depends on where you're at. But listen, I want you to be bold. I want you to be strong. I don't want you to shy away from the conditioning that may have been upon you at the previous ministry that you were involved in. And I think you'll see why. So I think if you give me a couple of Sundays, you'll start to see, hey, this is not weird. This is exactly what I need to know. And by that, I think you will grow. And so we're going to start out very easy today, very simply. We're, again, as I mentioned, we're calling it Futures. That's the series. Today, we're going to be looking at a message entitled Foundations. And I'll read this passage to you. It's Isaiah chapter 45, verse 21 and 22. This is God speaking. Declare what is to be, present it. Let them take counsel together. Who foretold this long ago? Who declared it from the distant past? Was it not I, the Lord, and there is no God apart from me, a righteous God and Savior? By the way, that's exclusive. He's the only God, and he's the only Savior. There's only one. There is none but me. Verse 22. Turn to me and be saved, all you ends of the earth, for I am God and there is no other. That's the word of God. He knows the future. 
He's the God you love. He's the God you pray to. He's the God that sustains you. But listen, he's also the God that has written the future down in advance. It's called Bible prophecy. And then one more passage, and we'll, we'll visit this again in length at the end of our message today. It's the very heart of not only the Bible, it's the very heart of Bible prophecy. 1 Corinthians 13, 11. Paul said, when I was a child, I spoke as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. When I became a man, I put away childish things. He's talking about throwing off the yoke of unbelief and coming into the maturity of belief. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know just as I also am known. And now abides faith, hope, love. These three, but the greatest of these is what church? Love. Love. Again, Father, we pray that you would move in our midst today. And Lord, if there's anybody here, well, I know there's a lot of people here that are saying, let's do this. Let's go for it. And there are a lot of people also listening in right now that they've been conditioned to not get into what the Bible says regarding the future. And therein, they have been robbed. And there's a reason why 27 to 31% of your Bible is about the future, Bible prophecy. So, Father, we pray for a great blessing upon this church, upon each individual. Lord, the hundreds of home groups that are meeting us right now online together, and all those who will hear the going forth of this message, we pray that you'd bring us together in your word as one. In Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen. Amen. You can be seated. Foundations. It's where we begin in our future series. In our desire to be like Jesus as a believer, it's our heart's desire to be like Jesus. Our greatest pursuit as believers is to be like him. It's certainly the very goal of every disciple. The Bible tells us in Matthew 22 verse 34, but when the Pharisees heard that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees. There was a debate and argument between the Sadducees and the Pharisees regarding resurrection, and Jesus let them know the truth. They gathered together. Then one of them, that is a lawyer, asked him a question, testing Jesus, and saying, verse 36, Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And Jesus answered and said to to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. I want you to mark those last few words, all the law and the prophets. That's very, very key. If you have a Bible, will you hold it up? Even if it's on uh, your smart device, hold it up. Wow, that's beautiful. Okay, this book, listen, this book that is written in in, uh, paper and ink or on your device, this book is a book that has proven itself to be bulletproof. And the reason why that's true is what Jesus said a moment ago, that all of this leading power and reality of the believer to love God and to love your neighbor like you do yourself, all of that, if passionately pursued, sums up the law in the prophets, the entire word of God. Now look, everybody, please be careful. I am not saying that if you are just a really loving person, you know how people are, there's some people, they were just born loving people. I was not born that way, but some people are born that way. They just love everybody. And listen, that doesn't mean it's Christian love. That doesn't mean it's God's love. That can be more of a personality trait. No one is born with this virtue that Jesus is talking about this morning. It is a divine love for God, which God allows you, gives you to have, And it's a divine love for others. That means that you and I can love somebody who's actually trying to kill us, who hates us. 
that you have a gut-wrenching compassion for them, even though they mean harm to you. Do you hear what I'm saying? It is an unearthly, unnatural, not of this realm kind of love. It's not that you have a good constitution or a sweet disposition. It's transcendent. God's love. You say, what does that do to the Bible prophecy? Because I told you we're starting basic and this is the foundation. Friend, everything that you're going to be hearing in this series, you must remember this first. The foundation is God loves me. He has hope for me and God expects my faith to grow. Faith, hope, and love. That should be at the top of your notepad as we go through this study. Everything there will be our building point. The first thing that we see this morning, jot it down if you would, regarding our foundations and the futures series is this, the future of faith. Mark that down, number one, the future of faith. You say, what on earth does that mean? The future of faith. I want you to understand that what I'm about to say, here's a disclaimer up front, is not bombastic. I am not exaggerating. This is not what pastors are supposed to say on a Sunday morning. It's 100% true. And it's this. Your faith is the greatest possession you have. You need to know that. Now, listen, if your life has been cruise easy, smooth, no bumps up until now, then that doesn't make much of an impact to you. But if your life has been normal like the rest of ours, and you've been smacked in the face a few times spiritually speaking, or maybe physically speaking, uh, God's promises to you mean everything, and that means that you exercise faith to cling on to God's promises. Listen, faith is an absolute necessity, listen, in our lives, but it's very critical as to where it is applied, because every human being exercises faith. Every, one, every single one of us. But for me to say to you, your faith is the greatest possession that you have, don't take that lightly. You lose that and you lose life. You give up on that and you lose your hope. You give up on that and you lose your future. Very, very critical. Very important that we begin to build this series upon the statement regarding the future of faith for us as individuals. The Bible says in Hebrews 11, verse 1, now faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. Look, look at it on the screen. Mark the verse down, Hebrews 11, 1. This is a very, very cute, uh, seemingly benign verse. It's, it, it appears on your little memorization scripture cards. You'll see it posted in someone's Instagram, and it's such a sweet sentiment. Oh, no, it's not. It is an absolute bold declaration of a reality that some people look at it and say, I don't get it. And some people look at it and will say, I can't live without it. This is absolutely spectacular. Faith, according to the Bible. Now, faith, faith. Now, what I am going to lean upon in my life and what I'm going to make as the foundation of my existence is wrapped up in my action of faith. Please hear this. Never have faith in faith. And I know you can go to the Christian books, not, it, not this one. You can go to a Christian bookstore and buy books on having faith in faith. Ladies and gentlemen, that's false teaching. Oh, guys, sorry, verse back up on the screen. You want to be able to, you want to, be able to make sure that your faith, faith demands that it is, it is pointing toward a, a, a subject, a person, place, or thing. I'll be honest. You have faith in a person, a place, or a thing. Now, faith is the substance. That word substance is something you can hold and touch. So wait a minute, I thought faith by nature is something that's ethereal. You can't grab it. You can't touch it. In a normal realm of science, that's true. But in the realm of faith with God, there's a bigger truth. And that bigger truth is faith takes you to the promises of God where you can grab them. And don't, tell, don't ask me how this works. But you could have a doctor give you a pill because you're sick and that doesn't work. But 
Faith can be exercised in Christ Jesus, and there's a presence that comes near to you that you can't buy. There's no pill. You can't have somebody bring it. It doesn't arrive in a box. It is his presence. Him in his word, him in his comfort, him in his promises. It is foundational. It is awesome. And we need to know this as we move into this series. Faith is the substance. I can touch this thing, this person, or this promise that I have faith in. How so? Of things hoped for. This is an awesome statement. It's not like, oh, I I have faith and I really hope, I hope, I hope, I hope. Oh, I hope, I hope. Guess what? Happy to report. That's not what the word means. You know, like, I hope there's no traffic going to work today. That's not what the word means. This is a hope. This is a hope that, okay, you see this platform I'm standing on? It's wood beneath me. I have total hope that the people who built this, it's going to keep me up. Hear the, hear, did you hear I use the word? I have no doubt. I have total hope in this. Okay? That's the word. It is an assured, guaranteed fulfillment. Thank you, Lord. Hope for, watch, the evidence of things not seen. The truth proclaiming that my faith in Christ is so dependable upon him, not me, him. Listen, listen. My faith dependability on him causes me to have great faith because of him. So, uh, Pastor, I don't have much faith. And then I listen to people tell me, well, what's going on? They actually have tremendous faith. What they're really saying is, I don't understand what God's doing in this situation. I'm willing to totally yield to whatever he wants to do. I just wish he would tell me a little bit about it. (laughs) That's huge faith. Even the person who says, I don't believe in God anymore. He broke my heart. This is what happened. And then the other thing. And then the other thing. And I'm mad at him. That's the wrong attitude. And that is the wrong place to be. But that's great faith. Think about it. They have the faith to believe and to confess that God's big enough to have fixed their life situation by now. That's great faith. It's misimplied at the wrong moment of time. But the truth is, God's at work. Evidence of things not seen. You need to hang on to that verse and put it right up there in the note-taking of our study. Faith, by definition, listen, everybody, faith, by definition, assumes a future. You all know that, right? Write that down. Faith, by nature, assumes a future. Every one of us have faith in something. In someone, I hope it's Christ. I trust it's Christ. But To even speak about faith, it assumes that there's a future. In other words, faith is something that is used, yes, regarding the past, as we shall see, yes, in the current, but also for the future. That's that's an assumption. Listen, it's a logical assumption. It's reasonable. You can defend that. And so the goal of this series is to establish that very thing, that all that you hear is to build your faith, not scare you. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to quote my good friend, Dr. Ed Heinsen. Wonderful statement Dr. Ed made. God did not give us Bible prophecy to scare us. He gave us Bible prophecy to prepare us. And that's a great word. So number one under this point is this. Past foundations build faith. Mark that down. This is a very, very important part of your life, believe it or not. Past foundations, I'll explain that, build faith. Again, the book of Hebrews, chapter 10, verse 9. By faith, he, Abraham, dwelt in the land of promise as a foreign country, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. That's faith. Wow. For he waited for the city which has foundations whose builder and maker is God. The life of Abraham. What do we know? We look back at Abraham's life. Watch this. It's pretty cool. Abraham was given a promise by God about the future. And everything about Abraham's life, though you and I now are viewing it in real time in the past, builds our faith. 
this is why it's so important that you and I study the life and do bi- what's called biographical studies of great men and women of God before us. You should be doing that in your time. By the way, I, I, I can't believe I'm about to say this, but Amazon Prime, if you have Amazon Prime and you go to the Christian section, they have remarkable documentaries about Martin Luther, uh, they, uh, John Huss, uh, John Knox, uh, William Tyndale. They've got trem- uh, Richard Wombrandt most recently, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, and it's, I've seen them all. Very accurate, very well done. I'm impressed. Why do we even look at such things? Because those who have gone on before us, those who are to us in the past, are great people to learn from, and we start with Abraham. When I study and read and learn from the life of Abraham or any Old Testament uh, example, what does it do? It builds my faith. Why? Because everything about them, this is why we love them, but we don't have to see it. Everything about their life is based upon the promise God gave them. Ladies and gentlemen, are you sitting down? That's called prophecy. See, you think prophecy is the dragon with ten horns. And this beast rises out of the sea, and I'm, and the, and you run out of church. <laughs> we'll get to those parts; they're pretty cool. But I'm going to really get you ready for it. But when the Bible says in Genesis 3:15, for example, when God says that from the woman the Messiah is going to come from Eve, that is the first prophetic eschatological statement in the Bible: salvation. It's not the statue's ten toes or the dragon. God's first prophetic message is salvation. After this Adam and Eve fumble, salvation will come to you. And that's the entire Bible announcing to you. It's all prophetic if you think about it. It's beautiful. Past foundations build faith. By the way, please mark this in your mind. If your faith today in your mind is something like a fallback or it's something I go to when things get tough. It's my spare tire. It's my, what's the word? Break glass in case of fire. You know, this faith, you know, I'm I'm good, I'm good. Let me ask you something. Do you need more faith? I do. Now, very personally... In the last, how long has it been? So nine months almost? Nine months of craziness? Ten months of craziness? Has your faith been strengthened? Are you growing? Have the things of God and the promises of God become more real to you? I'm going to assume that's true because you're here. Think about it. And you come at a cost. And I'm not talking about getting sick. It's flu season. Can I say this? Um, it's flu season. We're, we're probably going to get the flu this season. It's called flu season. So what? I was, you're gonna, every year, there's been a flu season every year for like the last 10,000 years. But listen, with all of this and all that's coming, think about it in the world around us, you're going to need a greater faith. So how do I get a greater faith? You're right. This is the right spot. Because you're going to have such an appreciation for the Bible. You're going to have such a dependence upon the Bible. And you're going to say, you know what? Wow. God loves me so much. He told me these things in advance. He didn't want me to be scared. He wanted me to be prepared. Past foundations build faith. Secondly, current foundations build faith. Faith. You see, what is that? That is putting into practice what we know, what we believe. Current foundations build faith. And what I mean by that is um, that you today uh, have God in his Bible as your go-to foundation. Where do you go to when your world is rocked? Where do you go to when you see hap- something happening on the news or uh, in your family or in your life? Where do you go? Do you go to the Bible? Because listen, we can do that now in our current 
foundation situation building faith because we learn from the past that God keeps his word to his patriarchs. He, keeps, he kept his word to all of those biblical personalities that you read about. And you love reading the book of uh, Psalms because David and others are lamenting and, and revealing their hearts and God comes in and you love all that because listen, the past builds faith and it carries you right now to the present in this situation. Right now, what are you go- don't, don't say anything, but what are you going through right now? A, will freak you out and cause you to panic or B, you're gonna realize, wow, God's in control I don't understand what's going on. His word's true. You can trust him. Abraham did. Joshua did. And I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. You ever see somebody when they make up their mind? I'm going to do it. You ever see people jump off of uh, like cliffs? I, 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 don't, I love heights. I can go right to the edge of the Empire State Building. I love, I love that feeling. It's like, yes! Woo! There's, I love that. I don't, have a, I don't fear heights. I just, I just don't. It's probably not good. It's kind of overdeveloped, maybe. <laughs> but there's, I cannot jump off a cliff, I don't know why, into water. I just, there's something about that. It's like, I don't know, I don't know. Because in my mind, I, it, my luck, the biggest fish in the whole lake would be swimming just below the surface the moment I left the edge. Or there'd be a, I'd notice that there's a, you know, sandbar right there. Something would happen. Freaks me out. But there's some people, you know that moment where they say, I'm doing it. Let's go. Like, the, you know, some of these rides that there used to be a place called Disneyland. It was once, it was once in, a, in, a, in a galaxy far, far away. But I don't do rides. I love airplanes and you can put me upside down and inside out and I don't care how fast or slow, let's do, I don't, let's do it. Airplanes, God made airplanes, makes perfect sense to me. Airplanes were built, that, I, don't see, I, don't get, I don't get roller coaster rides. Ain't gonna happen. You know why? I'm standing in line and all I'm thinking about is, who built this? Who were they? Were they on drugs the day they built this? Who designed this? I need to talk to somebody. I don't like it. And so what happens, we get right up there and I step out and my granddaughter goes by herself. That's what happens. <laughs> Papa, you're a chicken. That's right, chicken, right here. Not gonna go. I don't have faith in that stuff. But the moment somebody says, I got it, let's do it. Shouldn't we not be like that with faith? God has never let you down. You may have misunderstood what God has done. That's most often our situation. But he's never let you down. Never. And you can build a foundation of faith on what's going on in the current world around us. The world in the next couple of months, the world will be discussing in Davos, the global economic world problem. The world is in an unprecedented problem right now. The world. And they're going to be discussing the global economic community. If you know Bible prophecy, you're saying, oh, wow, I'm going to be watching this. Why? Because we're going to watch everything through the lens of what we know from the Bible. Does any of this stuff on the news apply to my current situation? And of course, you can begin to see that. Religious freedoms and liberties and the direction of our nation and and world. All of these things, Jesus said, when you see these things beginning to come to pass, when you just see the little bit of the sun peeking up on the eastern sky, you know that my coming is at the door. How awesome is that? And you should be excited about that. That ministers to us. I look for every opportunity to insert this quote because it's so sweet to my soul. It's blessed me many times. But when we talk about the current foundation and situation and how we need to have faith, the Bible tells us, I'm going to give you this Bible verse and then this quote. The Bible tells us in 1 Chronicles 12.32, it's an amazing statement. And this is what I pray for this church. And from the tribe of Ishakar, there were 200 leaders of the tribe with their families. All these men understood the signs of the times 
and knew the best course for Israel to take. That should be a testimony of your faith and your family and your walk with God and this church. We discern the times and the seasons in which we live, according to the Bible, and that information causes you and I to know what we ought to do next as believers. And that's going to bring you hope. It's going to bring you strength. It's going to bring to you faith. And the love of God will settle your heart. It's awesome. That quote is from one of my favorite people in all the world. Can't wait to meet him. Samuel Adams, patriot, founding father, governor of Massachusetts, signer of the Declaration of Independence, rebel. We, well, he was. Creator of the Boston Tea Party. Right? I mean, he did a lot of fun stuff, this guy. Uh, we have appealed to heaven for the justice of our cause, and in heaven we have placed our trust. Numerous have been the manifestations of God's omnipotence in sustaining us. We have been reduced to distress, and the arm of omnipotence has raised us up. Let us still rely in humble confidence on him who is mighty to save. Good tidings will soon arrive. We shall never be abandoned by heaven while we act worthy of its aid and protection. Isn't that a great statement? And, and I love that because all that is biblical truth. Let's live our lives. We are not going to, listen, we are not going to close the curtains and hide at a time like this. We're the ones running around the ship throwing out life rafts to people while people are hiding in their cabin scared. I had a lady come out. I was doing a wedding last night in Palm Desert, and there was some woman going through the uh, foyer of the hotel. And uh, I was talking to the, the father of the bride, and we're hugging. We, we've known each other forever. We're hugging and talking and carrying on. And this woman comes up, and she goes, where's your mask, the two of you? Where's your mask? And uh, he jumps right out of the gate, and he said, I'm good, lady. I already had it. I, I can't get it, and I can't give it away. I've had it. And she starts arguing with him. You don't know that, and what about you? And I looked at her, and she, she, was, she, had to, she was older than me. Um, and I said, she, she, she said, do you, where's your mask? You want a mask? And I said, no, I don't want a mask. I'm good. And her husband walks up, and he says, is she, gentlemen, is she bothering you? <laughs> and it was tremendous because he said, listen, uh, she's wearing her mask. If the mask works, she's fine. Yes. That, that old man said that. If she's wearing her mask, if the mask works, she's fine. Now, if the mask works, she's fine. Do you hear him going with this? What is said out in the world around us may or may not be true. But would to God, people, could you imagine if that woman would have walked up to us and said, both of you, are you sleeping with your own wives? Are you doing drugs? Are you cheating on your income tax? Do you speed? You better get your act together. You know what I'm saying? Wouldn't it be great if we had a terror of sin like that? Put on your mask. How about this? Put on Christ. Put on Jesus. Put him on. Put him on. Everybody's worried about something that, listen, 99.96% you're going to recover from. Not sin. It's 100% fatal. Sin will kill you. It's dangerous. So when you look around and you realize, because maybe this is news to you, Jesus is coming. He could come back today. That should cause you, listen, to put on Christ. You want to get ready? Put on Christ. Amen. You want to get super safe? Put on the blood of Christ. Amen. Very important. Thirdly under this point is future foundations build faith. Future foundations. That's what we're doing as Christians. Man, do you ever think about that? 
We should think about this. This should be common thinking for us. Every time you and I read our scriptures, pray, and go through a Bible study like we are right now, we are literally laying down a foundation regarding the future. And this is amazing to me. I've often told you guys, I don't understand how it's going to work, but what time you spend right here, right now, going through the Bible right now, will literally equate to dividends in eternity. God is going to somehow take this morning because it's eternal. Long as this word is being allowed to speak and he's investing in you so that it will matter in the day of eternity. We're not wasting. Oh man, I went to church. I wasted time. Not if you listened. Okay. If you're tweeting your friends and stuff, then you blew it. But if God's word is open, God has promised, the Holy, Jesus said the Holy Spirit will teach us the word of God. And so that's the key to church growth, by the way. You want a stable church? Teach the Bible. It doesn't, listen, it's a funny thing. You teach the Bible, the church will be under constant attack. It's good to see what kind of enemies you have. At the same time, that church will be invincible because the Lord is at the helm. It's pretty awesome. Pretty exciting. The future. You're building on the future. The more you pour in, the more deposits you make, so to speak, in your Bible knowledge and growth. Isaiah chapter 42, verse 9 says, Behold, the former things have come to pass. That means there's things I've told you about in the past. Now look, they've come to fulfillment. And new things I declare. Before they spring forth, God says, I tell you of them. You need to write that down. Friend, listen, if you're a Muslim, you don't have that in your Bible. Or, well, you don't have a Bible. You could get a Bible. They're free. Write us. Let us know. We'll get you a Bible. But the Quran has no prophecies in it. And whatever, quote, prophecies there are, they're actually lifted right out of the New Testament and inserted into the Quran. But even that's a stretch. The God of the Bible is the only one that tells you the future in advance. You're not going to get any news about the future in advance from the Tibetan uh, Book of the Dead. You're not going to get anything about the future regarding Hindu, uh, out of Hinduism or Buddhism. The God of the Bible says, here's one of the ways that you can identify who I am. I'm going to tell you this in advance. Write it down. And what happens when it comes to pass, God says, I'm the one. Amen. That's awesome. Absolutely awesome. The Bible says in Matthew 5, 17, Jesus said, do not think that I came to destroy the law and the prophets. That's the entire Old Testament. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For assuredly, I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, one jot or one tittle, one little comma or one little hyphen will by no means pass away from the law till all is fulfilled. This Bible, every word is going to be fulfilled. You can take that to the bank. And here's a grave warning. I mentioned this the other day. In fact, um, last Sunday, uh, this was brought up in the closing of our message with Dr. Frank Turek. Revelation 21, verse 6, we're talking about faith. Faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, not in you. Faith in God's word, not in a horoscope. Trusting in the Lord, not yourself. Revelation 2, 6. And he said to me, John is speaking, it is done. Take note who's speaking to John. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give of the fountain of the water of life freely to him who thirsts. He who overcomes shall inherit all things. The he who overcomes is the one who finishes their course that God has given. Every one of us have been given a different course. And I will be his God, and he shall be my son. Verse 8. But the cowardly and unbelieving. And he goes on to list more. The abominable, murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, all liars, shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. The point is, look at the two leading Descriptions of who inherits hell. 
the cowardly, and the unbelieving. People who have no faith in God, and people who have no faith in God, and it manifests itself in a cowardly life. No trust. No confidence in God. They may have had confidence in themselves, but not God. It's a tremendous statement. I want to give you three scriptures, and then a little bonus one. It'll be a fourth, totally, but three scriptures. Are you guys okay? Yes. Okay, three scriptures that, that are proof positive uh, that you can build your faith upon the past, today, and the future, according to God. In fact, John 13, 19, this is Jesus speaking. He says, I tell you before it comes. Oh, I love that. I tell you before it comes that when it does come to pass, you might believe that I am he. Oh, my goodness. And the last thing you ever want to hear in a critical situation, I don't know if it's the contractor, if it's the guy cutting your tile, or if it's maybe you bought your wife the super and once it, you know, there's no other diamond like this one and the diamond cutter is going to cut, I don't know. Or the doctor. Can you imagine the doctor? Can you imagine if you're awake and the, the surgeon, they got their stuff on, and the, guy, the, the doctor, he's going along, and you hear him say, oh, wait a minute, we didn't, we didn't know this part. We didn't see this. What is that? Excuse me, Dr. Dr. Jones, have you seen, I've never seen one of those things. I don't think you'd want to hear that. Or if the guy's cutting your, you know, your tile and there's down to the last cut or something and the guy, the guy just, oh, oh no. He's like, what, 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 what? That's the last thing you want to hear. Like the airplane's taking off and the, uh, the pilot says to the co-pilot, did you fill up the tank? Before? <laughs> you want to hear that? No, you know what you want to hear? You want to hear this. You want to have someone come up and say, this is the way, this is the way it's going to unfold. This is going to happen. And then you're going to see this and then the other thing. And then just when you think that this is going to go this way. And so buckle up, but now you know. Isn't that what you want to know? That's what I want to know. People will say, we don't know what's going on. We don't know what happens when you die. Well, I feel sorry for you. Because the Bible is full of what happens to you when you die. And the cool thing is, we not only love and worship the one who knew how to live, he knew how to die, and then he came back and said, oh, this is how it's going to go. And it's like, okay. I like that. Future foundations build faith. Yes, we can get on an airplane, fly to Jerusalem. I can walk you in front of the garden tomb. It's empty. It's pretty awesome. You travel 15 hours, 7,000 miles, drive from Jerusalem to the garden tomb or Tel Aviv to the garden tomb to see absolutely nothing. <laughs> it's the only pilgrims in the world. Somebody shows up. What are you looking at? Nothing. <laughs> there ain't nobody in there. He's gone. He's risen. He's up. He's out of here. He's Jesus. John 14, 29, and now I have told you before it comes that when it does come to pass, you may believe. That's John 14, 29. You see, that sounds just like John 13, 19. Yes, he's repeating it over and over again because it's so important. Here's another one, John 16, verse 4. But these things I have told you that when the time comes, you may remember that I told you of them. Why did he tell them that? To bring them comfort. And your faith, if it's in Christ, you should have that comfort. And then here's the bonus. Revelation 19, verse 10. Great verse. Revelation 19, 10. John says, I fell at his feet to worship him. This is a uh, fellow servant. We don't know if it's another departed disciple or apostle, or is it an angel? But he said to me, this, heavenly, this person in heaven said to John, See that you do not do that. I am your fellow servant and of your brethren who have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. He tells us the truth in advance. 
The second thing, point number two, mark it down if you would, is that the future is hope. The future of hope. The future of hope. This is all foundational to our series. The psychology of hope, by the way, is a very interesting thing because it's much like faith in a way. It's not the same, of course, but it's, 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 it's like it. It kind of has a, the same kind of benefit to us. But the psychology of hope, uh, it's interesting because uh, you can only have hope. Listen, everybody, you can, have, you can only have hope if you assume or believe that something exists or it's going to manifest. Hope. So you have faith in what God has said. That's awesome. Your faith should take you now to the next step, and that's hope. God, listen, God said it. You know the old bumper sticker? God said it, I believe it, that settles it. That's a, that's a cute sticker from the 70s. But it's true. God said it. That's faith, I believe it. But if I really believe it, listen up. How will I know it's true in my life? I know it's true on paper, but how do I know it's true that is active in my life? I will have hope. You need hope. But I warn you today, where's your hope? Getting back to that wedding yesterday, I challenged both the the groom and the bride-to-be it was perfect. Everything was perfect. It was in Palm Desert, oasis. Swans were everywhere. The desert at this time of the year, it was 74 degrees. The sunset was insane. There was not one breeze, so the candles were burning perfect. Everything was perfect. She pulls up with her dad in a boat. And everyone's watching and the cameras are going. And you should have, just the look on Andrew's face was incredible. It's just awesome. And I'm looking around, knowing what today's message was about and knowing that about this point right here, everything about everybody, watch, I'm, listen, everything about everybody, it was the tale of two, two cities, so to speak, two people. There were a lot of people there with incredible smiles and tears as they watched this picturesque storybook moment unfold and no one though had the beaming glory of Andrew and as he watches his bride come and he's starting to cry and um, I, I'm, I take advantage of that all the time I turn my mic off I'm kind of harassing him to try to get him get them breathe some air get back you know and <laughs> you got to do that kind of stuff sometimes keep the service going and he's just overwhelmed and then I could see people out there, listen, most of them sadly, most of them sadly were women. And they're, they're like this. And maybe, I was, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe it's because I'm viewing last night through the lens of the, today's message. But it looked like there was a lot of indifferent men out there. Didn't pick up on much of anything. And a whole lot of disappointed, heartbroken people, women. I'm generally speaking now. But the contradiction was those that were, whoa, whoa. And I thought about God's love. And I actually used that. I didn't mention it to them. But it caused me to speak to the audience with a certain challenge about love and about faith and about hope. And everything about that couple was heightened because it was their wedding day. How did they ever get to the wedding day? Hope. How did that happen? Faith. They have, they've committed. They exchanged vows. They said they love one another. And they, by faith, made the commitment. And then, because they made the commitment, there's this grand presence of hope. And that's not much of a stretch to the Christian life. You've made this commitment. You've given God your vows. And you have hope in him. Not hope in the dollar. Not hope in the government. Not hope in your health. 
not hoping in anything else but him. What a difference. The Bible tells us in Ecclesiastes 3.11, he that is God has placed eternity in our hearts. You know, there's a book written, what's his name? Alexander Pope wrote an an essay of man. He's the one that coined the phrase, um, hope uh, hope springs eternal. Remember, you've heard that before, haven't you? Hope springs eternal. That's from Alexander Pope's book. But the Bible says that he is, he, God, has put eternity in our hearts. You are designed to hope. And you need to get this under your belt starting today. God did not put that in you to have an expectation of hope so that you would be dashed and broken against the rocks. He doesn't play with you like a cat might play with a ball of yarn. You have that desire of hope coming and hope being fulfilled because that is an attribute of what it is to be a human. God put that in you. But misread, you can be like somebody in that wedding, bitter, stone-faced, not feeling anything because they've been hurt. Are you with me? Their, Their guts have been ripped out a few times and then put back in and they don't feel anything anymore. Remarkable. Hope is a human attribute. And it, I got to tell you, I believe hope makes no sense without the existence of God. This may be a weak argument to you, but faith, hope, and love, they actually exist. And for me, it proves the existence of God. And you might say, put that on the table. Let's cut it up and dissect it and see. I'm sorry, you can't do that exactly that way. It's different. Hope is something we learn that is internal. It's an internal rudder. Hope will guide you, you know, in your decision making. We're, we're going to go quick now because I've got to end. I see, I, you know, as usual, <laughs> run out of time. Hope, internal rudder in your life. Listen, if you have hope in God, you're going to be less uh, prone to making mistakes or preemptive or uh, decisions in haste. You know the guy that says, man, you got to buy this car right now because there's 10 people coming down right now to buy this car. You know, I like you. You're my friend. I'll I'll sell it to you. you know, I'm going to discount it just for you, but you better hurry up. There's a family coming down right now to buy this car. I told you guys what to do before when that guy does that. They try to sell you a car like that or a washer or a dryer. I don't care what it is. You tell them, oh my goodness, you told them they're they're coming down now? (laughs) Yes, right now. So you better hurry up. Let's seal the deal. Well, I don't want them to be disappointed if you told them they're coming down. I'll see you later. (laughs) Works every time. (laughs) Don't make decisions when you're hopeless. When there's no internal rudder of hope in your life, you're going to make bad decisions. Panic. You may not be biting your nails and you may not be pulling your hair out. But you know what? Because you're not trusting God and you don't have hope in God, you're making one bad decision after another. And if that's left unchecked, you will sink into a depressed state. Watch out. Jesus said, mark it. Jesus said, In John 16, 33, these things I've spoken to you that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, difficulty, hardships. But be of good cheer, he said, I have overcome the world. That's just not a statement. That's a reality. That's a fact. That's true. Hope is also an external message. Hope. External message from you and I as believers. In this series, I pray that this series causes people to come to the knowledge of Jesus. Because why? It's going to equip you better to operate with external hope. You say, what do you mean external hope? For you to live a life, an active life of hope. I predict, I'm not a prophet, I'm just predicting as a human would say, that in the days ahead, because God is amazing, his timing is always perfect, that you are going to become some form of a missionary if you attend this church. Because God is going to take these studies and he's going to say, I want you now to take the hope that you have within you and make it external. 
Let it be around you. Let people see it. Let people know it. And I'm not talking about being a preaching fool. I'm talking about living a life of hope. Because the world is going to experience some major shaking in short order. And you're going to be there not because you're the rock. It's because you're tied to the rock of all ages. He will sustain you. Internal rudder. External messaging is our lives. And then thirdly under this point is the fact that hope is to be a projected strength. Man, there's something awesome that when the bombs are bursting in air and everything's gone nuts and the boat's upside down and uh, and the the, the, you name it, and, and there you are. Your family, your witness, whoever you may be. And when I say a projected strength, that hope is a projected strength. I believe people will seek us out. Right now, they, right now, people are somewhat neutral. The atmosphere will change. You're going to be blamed for everything, Christians. It's starting right now with the Thanksgiving season. The Christian, the uniquely Christian, holy American day. And the world will turn on you. And then all of your friends and neighbors and family will look to see how you deal with it. And you know what? Because your hope is settled in Christ and in these difficult, challenging days, you'll have a projected strength. It's not you. It's him. And it's going to emanate. They're going to see it. And they're going to see it in you when you don't think they're seeing anything at all. Pretty awesome. I like that. And then third, because we're out of time, the future of love. In the words of the famous philosopher Tina Turner, she said, <laughs> What's love got to do with it? Everything. Everything, Tina. Everything. Love. The overriding human experience, need, desire, requirement, priority is the single most powerful evidence for the existence of God, and that is man is not fulfilled until he knows the love of God. You can pursue people forever and never be truly, deeply, internally forever satisfied until you come into the knowledge of the love of God. You can have the most wonderful husband, and you can have the most wonderful wife and uh, fantastic and all of that. But all of it is a picture. It's a hint. It's just a little bit of seasoning compared to what God has prepared for those who love him. And that is the love of God. Listen, because it is absolutely essential that a human receive the communication of love, the Bible tells us God is love. Three fast things, and then we're going to stand. In fact, go ahead and stand right now. I mean it. It's deliberate. You'll see if you get my notes online, you'll see how this ending is deliberate. God loves us. Let's be, let's be honest. Maybe you're here right now. You don't know anything about God, or you're tuning in. Oh, God loves us. Yes, it all works out fine, right? Because God loves us. Uh, depends, it depends on who's asking. Because the Bible says that God loves us, but he's angry with the wicked every day. That's a verse in the Bible, too. It's not as popular as the other verse. (laughs) Listen, there are people in heaven today, and there are people in hell today, and God loves both. Think of that. So wait a minute. If he loves both, then why is there a hell? Can't he just wave a wand? Nope. You mean there's some things God can't do? Yep. He can't be unjust. He can't sin. He can't lie. He can't be anything but pure. People don't wind up in hell today because God doesn't love them. In fact, God says, I weep over their death. Isn't that funny? Man. There's people who die and they're so wicked. 
that nobody weeps over their death. Some people are, thank good riddance. <laughs> you know, can you imagine? There's only one that weeps over the death of every individual, and that's Almighty God. But the fact that he weeps over the death of the wicked doesn't automatically default them into heaven. Not at all. The future of love, these three things. God's love for you will never diminish. It's impossible. Wow. We can't know that in, in, in our, you and I cannot know that in this world. In fact, when we love someone, in those moments of insecurity, we're a little bit fearful, wondering, do they love, do they love me as much as I love them? Well, you won't know unless it goes over time. Time reveals all. Secondly, God's love for you will never fail. <laughs> you got to remember that right now. His love will never fail you. I don't understand. He didn't ask you to understand. He asked you to trust him because he loves you. He'll never fail. God's love will never end. You're going to be, listen, you're going to be in heaven. Hypothetically, you're walking down the road in heaven. You trip over, you know, I have my garden hose out there. You trip over it and fall on your face. I start laughing because I thought it was spectacular. You get up, you start cussing me out in heaven. This little angel comes over, grabs you by the ear, opens this little cloud and throws you out. No, it's not going to happen. It would be amazing, though. <laughs> but it's not going to happen. <clears throat> Love failure, aisle nine. <laughs> no, it's not going to happen. It will never diminish his love for you. His love will never fail you. His love will never end. Here we go. 1 Corinthians 13. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love... I have become a sounding brass and clanging cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains but have not love, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned but have not love, it profits me nothing. Now watch this. Let's do this together maybe. Just pay cl close attention to this. Are you with me at verse 4? Watch. Just watch me and listen. Jesus suffers long and is kind. Jesus does not envy. Jesus does not parade himself. Jesus is not puffed up, proud. Jesus does not behave rudely. Jesus does not seek his own. He is not provoked. Jesus thinks no evil. Jesus does not rejoice in iniquity, but Jesus rejoices in the truth. Jesus bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things. Jesus endures all things. Jesus never fails. But whether they are prophecies, they will fail. And whether they are tongues, they will cease. And whether there is knowledge, it will vanish away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect is come, that's him, then that which is in part will be done away. When I was a child, remember this from this morning? I spoke as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now, we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know just as I also am known. And now abides faith, hope, love. These three, but the greatest of these is love. Church, you remember that in this series. God is going to speak to us about the coming invasion of Israel. He's going to name nations. He's going to challenge you to be ready. He's going to be speaking to you about the Holy Spirit in your life, symbolized in the scripture as oil and letting your light burning. And to be living a life that is constantly active now and relevant, all the while heavenly ready. 
Father, we praise you for your word. We praise you for your truth. We thank you, God, that in the name of Jesus Christ, Lord and Savior, Redeemer, King, that we would be ready today to meet you. Lord, I'm looking around this world and I'm saying, today's a good day. Today's a good day. We leave it all into your hands. But I pray, friend, as I interrupt my prayer, let's just remain in the attitude of prayer. Today, listen, you need to review these, this, these three, this trinity of discipleship. Faith, hope, and love. Do you know them? Do you enjoy them? Are they active in your life? Put your trust in Jesus. You'll never be disappointed. Look to him who is the author and the finisher of your faith and look up for behold, your redemption draws near. Well, hey, thanks for listening, and uh, we appreciate you. And of course we do in this time and in this age. Us being together and linking up together to get the Word of God out is actually ministry being fulfilled. And in fact, if you would like to subscribe, please do so. Hit the subscribe button. Tell your friends about us. And listen, if you'd like to help us get this out on a broader scale, you can support us by hitting on the Give Now button. And look, we're going to continue on with or without you. We're inviting you to join us. No pressure. But if you'd like to link arms in this venture, you'd be greatly appreciated. So listen, keep praying for us. We're praying for you. God bless you. And we'll see you back here real soon.